refreshed from our coffee break, we're going to turn our minds to what is new in Nepali. And then we're going to get an update from the central support services on what we can expect and the new developments that we have in the programme. So I'm in, delighted to hand the floor over to Faye Hindle lewis the Nepali project lead, and Graciela Spetoli, the European Basic Skills Network. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as uh, Tamsin said, my name is Faye Hindle Lewis, and I am the Apollo Project Lead at Ecorus UK and uh, representing today the Apollo Central Support Service. Before I go into my presentation, I would just like to um, extend my thanks to you all for attending uh, this event and particularly to. Uh, our National Support Service staff who helped facilitate the workshops today, to our panellists, and also I'd like to give a huge thanks to Tamsin, who has already shown herself to be an incredibly insightful and energising moderator, um, and I would like to thank her for the part she's playing in the, the conference. So thank you very much, Tamsin. So um, I've been uh, the project lead for the Apale Central Support Service um, since May this year. So I am new to Apale in this role. However, I've been working for uh, Ecorus for the past 18 years on a range of European funding programmes. I began my time um, working on Employment and Adapt, a European social fund. Then I've worked on the Lifelong Learning programme, including Grundtvig and the Erasmus Plus program. So I come very much from the background of uh, understanding the huge benefits that European collaboration and also um, funding programs like Erasmus and the, the uh, facilities and platforms that they fund, such as Ipale, um, and how these can benefit different sectors. So that's where my uh, heart is. As I say, I've been working on European programs for 18 years, so I'm a really big believer in the transformative power of education, but also collaboration. Um, so the Central Support Service is a, um, sorry, I should move the slides actually. Okay. Uh, the Central Support Service is a partnership between Ecorus UK and Intrasoft, and we also work with the European Basic Skills Network, and Graciela will be presenting a little bit on, on their work. Um, we are responsible for EPALE and for working with the national support services to promote the platform. Um, this event is a really key one for us. It is an opportunity for us to listen. That's what we're in. We're in listening mode. Um, you know, we, I totally acknowledge all the, the discussions that you've had today and the comments made um, in the panel. There are improvements that we um, need to make on EPALE in terms of the technical side and the uh, accessibility, and we are working very, very hard um, and reporting to the, the Commission to make those necessary improvements. Um, however, today is not just about acknowledging that, it's also about looking to the future. Um, I've heard some brilliant ideas today in the workshops and in the panel about how the platform could be used in the future to support future policy and practice. Um, and it, it's not just about the platform itself, it's about what we're asking people to contribute to the platform. The timeline that we're looking at is the next stage of adult learning policy, but the ideas for how Epale will develop are coming out today. So it's very exciting to hear those ideas around what kind of content and what kind of approaches um, we could use to keep Epale um, relevant and useful uh, for the future. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of Ipale in numbers. I'm going to talk a little bit about the latest user survey that we've just closed on the platform, um, and then let you know what we've been up to this year. So before I, I give you an overview of the, the numbers, I think for me, as a newcomer, relative newcomer to Ipale, the biggest question I had when I started was, is it Ipale or is it Epal? I still, I still don't really know. If we could have a show of hands so I can see. I say I've always said Ipale, even when I've not been involved in Ipale, but I know other people have always said Ipale. So if you say Ipale, if you pronounce it Ipale, could you put your hands up? Okay. And what about Ipale? 
Okay. <laughs> if I shall carry on saying a parlay then with uh, confidence. So in terms of the, the numbers uh, for the platform, at the end of uh, September 2018, we had just over 43,000 registered users. The site itself now shows the number of registered users on a live basis. So it will have gone up since the end of September, but that's where we were. So, um, you know, continuing to grow month on month. And actually, September saw a record number of, of users sign up over the, the month. Some interesting information about the countries where users are um, coming from. So if we look at the top 10 countries of origin for September again, Poland was in the lead for the percentage of visitors to the platform, followed by Italy uh, and the UK to complete the, the top three. Uh, Poland NSS have been doing some really great promotion of the platform via social media. So uh, their uh, promotion really, really paid off in terms of the, the visitors that they drew to the site. So congratulations, Poland. <laughs> Um, and just, just interestingly, that um, for the, the countries of origin at the start of the year, the, the most popular um, country for visitors was Italy, Poland was, in, in, was second, and the third most popular country of origin was Spain. So things are changing and, and moving on the, the platform. The next interesting um, element to tell you about was the top 10 user countries in terms of where registered users are coming from. Um, so you can see that Turkey has the highest number of registered users, uh, closely followed by Italy. And then we have um, Poland in, in third uh, this time. So just to give you a, a flavor of the spread of users and, and um, where they're coming from, just in terms of the, the top 10. And then the last uh, figure that I thought it would be good to look at is the social media is such an important uh, way of promoting the platform for us. So the CSA, when you take the central support service, uh, social media Facebook page, and all the national support service um, Facebook pages, we have over 90,000 likes um, between us, which I think is a really good figure. So that just gives you a little insight into the, the current uh, state of play on um, Epale. So now I want to talk to you uh, and give you some highlights from the recent user survey. So we're in the process of analysing these results. They haven't been published. We're uh, in the process of compiling the full report. Um, so in terms of the participants themselves, we had just under 1,000 responses. The survey was open over the summer period and closed in, in September. So if you look at this um, graph, the blue is... Um, the biggest number of respondents to the survey, and that's adult learning providers. And that mirrors very closely the balance of um, who uses the, the platform, where we know that providers and practitioners are a big part of the audience um, for the platform. The next um, three are, are pretty equal, but it, it's interesting, given the, the information from the panel about the number of, kind of research um, organisations or people who use... <laughs> Epale um, to ed for education purposes for students and future teachers. A large percentage of the, the respondents were academics and students. And we also had a good number of responses from national adult learning organizations or infrastructures, and also projects and partnerships, another big area for the, for the platform with the links to Erasmus+. Plus. And these are some of the, the highlights. 93% uh, of the respondents said they would recommend Epale to a colleague, uh, which was fantastic. 97% felt that the platform themes reflected their interests and their position. So the, it's clear that the content on there is highly regarded. It's felt to be very relevant. And then 81% rated the quality of the information provided as good. So it's not just that we're providing lots of information, there's tens of thousands of resources on the platform. That information is felt to be high quality and relevant and appropriate for the audience, which I think is um, very positive. So that's just a, 
a very quick tour of the, the highlights. We will be publishing the, the full um, user survey results and a report um, on the platform in the coming weeks. So um, I think the other thing is we looked at, we asked people what they thought about Epale, and these are the, the things that they, um, the themes that came through. Epale is unique, and it is seen as unique. People recognize that it is the only place where they can um, find the information that they're looking for for adult learning. Um, it's seen as a great source of information with the quality of its resources, and people appreciate the multilingual approach, and I think that is very important as well for the, for the platform. And then just some quotes. So we asked people what they thought Epale was doing well, and they said it's providing a wide range of material to interest a diverse audience, a one-stop shop for adult education. I mean, that's pretty perfect. We didn't, that wasn't an option. They, someone felt that themselves. Um, someone described Epale as giving me the right information in the right moment, which links to what some of the panel were saying. And then lastly, um, one thing that really resonated with me was connecting people, which is, is what Epale is all about. So in terms of the news, uh, what's happening in Epale in 2018, so the Central Support Service has been increasingly promoting the platform, but in a more targeted way, promoting different areas of the site, such as the policy portal, the um, communities of, of practice, and campaigning, uh, putting campaigns out for specific audiences such as practitioners. So we're continuing to, to promote it in a targeted way to try and reach different kinds of audiences looking for different topics, which I think is important to maintain that diversity. Um, we are putting more resource into animating the community. So we have our thematic coordinators, and this year they've been really looking at the communities of practice and how to enliven those um, and make sure that they're, they're meeting people's needs. And linking very nicely to what was uh, said in the, the panel session previously, we are looking at how Ipale can become more of a learning space. I think the question from the audience was, where are the courses? Where's the, the learning experience in that way on the platform? And actually, this is something um, that was a really relevant question because it's something that our, our partner, the European Basic Skills Network, is currently working on. And I would like to invite my colleague, Graciela, to come and talk to you about what they're doing for learning resources. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Uh, let's see where, yeah, there we are. Um, the EBSN is the European Basic Skills Network, and I'll say just a few words about it. I'm the General Secretary, and it's been going on since 2010. We are a policy-level network, but we, uh, our uniqueness is in the fact that there are in the network policy makers at national, regional, local level, and what we call policy providers, which may be a term we have coined ourselves. But we think of policy providers as both researchers, teacher training institutions, associations in civic society, educational NGOs, all the institutions that at national level can provide the background for better policy in basic skills. That means that many of you are in the network. Many of you should be. I will not give you a, a selling uh, speech, but do get in touch if you want to become a member. So what we are going to do, we have started to do, is to create a very special uh, sort of educational material. It fits very well with what Ed Alberto uh, said we needed in, uh, in Ipale. Uh, it's a learning resource that we have called the Capacity Building Series. Now, I thought I was doing it right. Next, there. Um, it is in the context of the Upskilling Pathways recommendation because I hope you have noticed the very important place that basic skills has in the upskilling pathways. And we need to create 
new policy and new initiatives and implement new initiatives in Europe that really involve all the stakeholders that need to be involved. And there is actually, about basic skills, there's too little knowledge in many of the stakeholders that need to be involved in upskilling pathways. In many countries, if you think of your own country, what do people think of when you say literacy? In many countries today, even among educators, literacy means alphabetization. The, the whole notion of functional literacy, of numeracy, of how these are linked to the capacity for learning, and the fact that you may have people with insufficient functional literacy in secondary education, it's lost to many stakeholders today. So we have felt in the network that there is a need to, to train both within and without the adult education sector the people that need to be involved in the upskilling pathways. That's why we are going to create uh, on the basis of existing resources, different capacity building units. Now, the whole Epale, as we have heard today, is an open educational resource. But then you have to go and find and know what you're looking for. What we are aiming to do is to create for each theme that I will show you later, for each theme, we are creating a frame on what we think everybody should know about this, everybody at policy level at least. And for all of those themes, we will gather the existing resources in Epale or outside Epale. If they are outside, they should come in. So we will make sure that they do come in. And then where there are gaps, where there are areas we haven't been able to find resources for, we will create interviews, videos, written articles, blogs, podcasts. I hadn't thought about that. I got the idea today. Yeah, podcasts are a very good idea. So we are going to fill in all the gaps and then lead you through it. But as an OER, what is the difference between an OER and a MOOC? An OER means it is a course, it has the, the, the structure of a course, but you take as much or as little of it as you want and you take it whenever you want and there is no grading and there is no teacher. You just go through it, but it's organized as a course. Now, on the basis of that, we will also... Uh, these are the themes, let me go through them first. For 18 and 19, we are planning on five different themes. Integrated basic skills policy, which will hopefully come out before the end of the year, and which is very interesting for all the countries that need to follow up the upskilling pathways. There will be one on digital inclusion. Workplace, workplace basic skills learning is already produced as a pilot, so it's already uh, there on Nepal if you look for it, but it needs to be uh, updated and made better. And migrant education and intergenerational and family learning, those are the five themes we are planning on for these two years, but much more will come. And we are also open for your ideas about what other themes we need to take. For instance, numeracy is still missing here. This is the structure of how we think we will work, the, or how we are working, actually, because we've started. The EBSN resources, EPALA resources for basic skills, whatever we already know of as existent is at the base. Then many of you have already participated in the online discussions in EPALA that we run on different themes, and we are we have already run some on the themes that I presented. There will be more, and those discussions help us find out what you think is important in such an OER, and also what resources are out there that we should uh, get better acquainted with. Then we gather all these in the thematic areas, and we create the open educational resource. 
which will be presented as a unit. As an, the next step, and for the first, for this OER that will be finished before Christmas, it will probably be first or second quarter of 2019, we will then create a MOOC. I always say that in adult education, we should get rid of the M because the masses are not there. But an OOC, an open organized course, so that you need to register for it. There will be a start and an end. There will be a moderator. There will be a community learning area where you can communicate with the other students of the course. And we are working on how to create one of those uh, budgets at the end so that you get an accreditation for this. So the idea is now to gather a lot of good resources, the sort of thing, to answer this question, if you need to present to a colleague from employment services or somebody who is tangential to adult education, what is literacy? What are basic skills? What would you give them in your country? We are interested in that kind of resources. Now, the linguistic aspect, we are going to create this in English but it will be open for all of you to translate. And when it comes to multilinguality, the last online discussion that EBSN organized in Nepal was multilingual, and it worked. We allowed you all to write in your own language and we used Google Translator to understand each other. I translated everything, and it works, so it is possible. So if you have ideas both for the themes we should take up, for resources we need, for uh, experts we should interview, please write to us. We're really looking forward to doing this together with you. Thank you.